But the fear of failure kind of almost sinks in is that actually people tend to put their head in the sand and things are going wrong around them. Yeah. And because they've got that fear of failure, which has led to the paralysis, we then have the ostrich syndrome. Is that the right one? It was not, it was the, right bird, not, the, not the emu, not the emu syndrome. syndrome. That's the one up the bum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the... Hey everybody, it's John Lamerton here alongside my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jason Brockman. We're here for another episode of the Big Idea Podcast. Where, as always, it is our job to help you get more customers and make more money without working harder. So, without further ado, let's dive straight into this month's episode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night, wherever you are, and welcome to the July edition of the Big Audio Podcast. John here alongside Jason. As always, how are you, Jason? Good morning, John. Yes, I'm good, thank you. Fantastic. We are talking today about... Fear, once again. We did cover fear in an earlier Big Idea podcast. We did. We talked about fear in general, but today we're talking about a very specific type of fear, aren't we? We are. And that fear is... Failure. The fear of failure. The fear of what if it doesn't work out? Mm. What if it doesn't go the way we think it's going to? What? Oh my God, what's going to happen? So why, why are we talking about this specifically at, at the moment, do you think? Um, just because within the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Group, we've had a few questions in the past which are about that, and in our private clients, there's a few questions about it too. So we thought it would be really nice to put it into the podcast um, and try to tackle it head on. Um, that fear of failure is, um, is, is, is what often leads us into inaction, and let's not do it because it might not work out like I want it to, or it might not um, happen <laughs> as I want it to, or actually I might be rejected and it'll all go wrong and the business will fold anyway. But actually, just by not doing it, <laughs> any action at all, then you're, you know that fear has kind of crippled your business, really. Mm. I always think if you look at um, the, the definition of entrepreneur, if you, you know, get a dictionary out and you look up the word entrepreneur, you will see person who takes risks that is that that is the definition of an entrepreneur if you are not taking any risks you're not an entrepreneur and to be fair i think i would class most business owners as entrepreneurs because you don't end up running a business without taking some risk without going actually do you know what i yeah i'm leaving the safety and security of a job and i'm gonna take the risk that it's all on me now. Mm-hmm. I've got to cover the bills. I've, you know, if if I want my kids to eat tonight, I've got to sell something. Yeah. That's a risk. Um, but I think people have risks that they're comfortable taking, and there's risks that they're not comfortable in taking. In our previous fear episode, we talked about the hula hoop mm-hmm. and about how if you do things that are just outside of that hula hoop, that stretches your comfort zone that makes you a little bit braver a little bit less fearful if you try and do something that's massively outside of your comfort zone you're not going to do it Mm -hmm. you're not going to have the desire or the inclination to think that you're capable of doing that Um, and I think you need to actually test yourself a little bit and find out where your boundaries are so you know we, we have a conversation with a client and we say to them right you need to start doing Facebook ads and you need to put together a funnel and you need to have seven emails in that funnel and you need to put together some videos and you need to lead people down this path and you need to create these product tiers and then yeah chuck some Facebook ads at it and in our minds because we've done all that but that's simple that's that's easy Mm -hmm. you just create a funnel chuck some traffic at it buy some traffic convert the traffic make the sales that's easy if you've never done that before and you are running a traditional bricks and mortar style business, the idea of doing digital stuff like that is like, oh my God, well, funnel, what, what, what is this funnel thing you talk of? Yeah. Write seven emails. Ooh, I've, I've got a blinking cursor looking at me. I, I, woo, that's not just outside of the comfort zone. That's massively outside the comfort zone. So what can we do? Well, let's bring it back and say, okay, let's start with something basic. Let's, can you write one email mm-hmm. you know can you know we'll work with you can you actually can we help you write that email can we get that polished up um facebook ads can you read a book on facebook ads can you set yourself a budget that is losable so don't look at it and say oh my god i've got to spend 
two grand a month on Facebook ads. And oh my God, what if I lose that money? I can't afford to lose two grand a month. Can you afford to lose a pound on a boosted post? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably can. You know, can you afford to, spe to say, I'm gonna spend 50 quid this month on Facebook ads? It is, you know, it's not gonna deliver you the huge amount of traffic you like, but what it enables you to do is learn the platform. It enables you to find out how do things work when you, or if you, do what you're afraid of and you accidentally press a button that spends all your budget in an hour, your budget's 50 quid. Yeah. You know, we, we just reduce the element of risk. Um, of course, that pushes your, your boundary a little bit because you've not done it before and actually yeah. now you've done a pound's worth and yeah. actually a pound worth is okay. That's not too bad. We've done all right with that. So that could be a pound a day. And because yeah. Facebook is so great at allowing you to budget, yeah. you can do a pound a day yeah. on, on your campaign. And so over a period of a week, you've only spent seven pounds and actually that's manageable. But if it kind of works out and you're getting some results from that, you can then scale that up if needs be and you can risk two pound a day, yeah. five pound a day. Hundred pound a day, and then you could be looking at you know the extra noughts if you need to. But that's uh, only as as you've grown with it, and actually your comfort zone has grown with it because you're actually comfortable with that risk. Yeah, it is. It's risk management, isn't it? Risk tolerance. It's you know you. There are things that you couldn't do a year ago that you now can, and you aren't afraid of doing that. You might have been afraid a year ago, so. Let's look at our golf journey, for mm -hmm. example. So our, our, well, certainly my New Year's resolution for this year was to play more golf. Gone out and I've, you know, we've had some lessons, we played some, some more golf. As part of the group, we've seen people grow and we've seen people who, you know, uh, let's say four months ago, had never picked up a club. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of knew which end was which, but in terms of how to hold it, how to, where to swing it, you know, all the technique, no, that was alien to them. If you'd said to, and you know, I don't want to name names, but if you'd said to one or two of those people at that first lesson, four months from now, you're going to go out and play nine holes mm -hmm. on the course. Oh, no, 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 no chance. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And it's only six I'm a liability. <laughs> yeah, you know. liability. <laughs> and what's going through their mind is that fear of failure. Oh, my God, I'm going to be too slow. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to lose my ball. I'm going to annoy all the other golfers. I'm going to hold everyone up. Oh, my God, I'm going to be an absolute liability. Mm -hmm. And what's going through their mind is that fear of what if it goes wrong? What if I step onto the course and forget everything I've learned in lessons, and I just slice every shot, and I, oh my God, I churn the grass up, and oh, and, I, and what if I'm wearing the wrong thing? It's that fear of everything is gonna go wrong, and it's your own brain telling you that everything is gonna go wrong. And now I posted a photo up on my feed last, on my Facebook feed last week of a brilliant, fantastic approach shot that I did on the 15th hole. Not your costume, fancy dress last night you wore. No, that wasn't that one. No, so, oh, right, okay. <laughs> Brilliant approach shot for the fifteenth. Unfortunately, yeah. I wasn't playing the fifteenth hole. I was playing the third <laughs> hole, which is kind of next to it, but going the opposite direction. Completely <laughs> skewed my tee shot massively off to the right. And went hunting for it. Like, oh my god! Brilliant, right on the green. Uh, right on the right on the green there. You know, it, it was possible for a, a par two. Uh, no, not for a par two. So it was possible for a two on a par five. Oh, unfortunately, I just didn't tee off in the right place. That's that's the thing. But do you know what? That's the worst that happened. Mm. And I'm I've played some games now with some people who've got a decent handicap. Mm -hmm. And do you know what? They do that sort of thing too. Mm -hmm. And it's fine. You know, I've been on the course and I've heard four as there's a ball sailing towards you. As somebody yeah. who didn't intend that shot to go anywhere near us <laughs> suddenly. <laughs> does a bad shot mm. people are inconsistent things go wrong but in your mind you always go what's the doomsday scenario what's the absolute worst that can happen here um, so to give you an example from our sports betting business at the moment some a recent risk we've taken is we've taken on actually a couple of new members of staff mm -hmm. um, as we've taken on these members of staff they then come in with more ideas about stuff we can do and all of a sudden it's like, well, actually we're gonna spend some money getting a new website done and we're gonna get an app built and we're gonna get this done, and we're gonna get that done. It's like, whoa, hang on a minute. 
the the kind of the, the, the financial director of me is now sat there going we're spending quite a lot of money here and it's all of a sudden that fear of failure kicks in mm-hmm. that what if this doesn't work you know I mean I, I totted it up if we are spending or we will be spending a hundred grand a year more this year compared to last year it's like whoa so if this goes wrong we are 100k down mm-hmm. that's real fear of failure is like well if this goes wrong we're 100 grand out of pocket yeah sheesh but let's break that down if it goes spectacularly wrong and literally everything we touch turns to shit we're going to know that pretty soon we aren't going to wait a year to discover oh my god what do you know? None of this has worked. Right. Oh, we're 100 grand out of pocket. No, no, of course not. We'll know within, say, th- let's say three months. Three months, we know actually, you know what, this, this ain't working. Three months isn't 100 grand. Three months is 25 grand. Let's just park that one there for a moment. Keep it, you know, do that. That's it. Park an idea that's going to go back there. So carry on. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I've got an idea that I'm parking. Okay. Right. <laughs> Can you just, just what is on this? Jason has an idea. Right, right. Like me. <laughs> there we go. I've got, I've got a peace sign, so you know it's parked, all right? All right, yeah. Okay. So the worst case scenario then, well, the absolute worst case scenario is after three months, we're 25 grand down. Realistically, are we going to be 25 grand down? Are we going to assume absolutely no return for our expenditure over those three months? That is really, really unlikely. It's more likely that we're going to make a fairly substantial loss. So perhaps we've lost 10, 15 grand Mm-hmm. over those three months and it's like okay this really isn't working um, we've tweaked some stuff this isn't working so you cut your losses what have you actually risked 10 to 15 grand let's say 15 grand mm-hmm. out of that headline oh my god it's a 100 grand risk it's not a 100 grand risk our risk is 15 grand now, what's the upside to that? Because when we're doing all the investments we do, we look at risk versus reward. Mm-hmm. So what's the upside? Well, if this works out and we spend this 100 grand and actually it works out, well, actually that 100 grand brings in 400 grand. So we're not risking 100 grand to make 400 grand. We're risking 15 grand to make 400 grand. Mm-hmm. that is a risk worth taking mm-hmm. and that's that's a process that I think people need to go through is you don't need to do everything in your business there are certain things you need to do is it a risk that is worth taking and actually actually work out the odds of okay what are the odds of this working what are the odds of it failing what is the best case scenario if it works out what what financial gain what business gain how many new customers do we get from this and if it doesn't work out, at what point do I know this isn't working out? And what is the worst, absolute worst case scenario at the point you cut your losses, what's the actual risk? Oh, look, a parking space. Oh, well. uh, yes, yeah, so as you say, <laughs> the good thing about what we're doing, kind of, and, and we do take that risk, and the way that you've mitigated it is really well because you've actually kept within the next three months, we know where that's kind of going to go. We yeah. need to keep a measure of how it's working out, that return on investment and that's coming in and actually where that's not working out and what we can do about that, which is fantastic. We tend to put their head in the sand and things are going wrong around them. Yeah. And because they've got that fear of failure, which has led to the paralysis, we then have the ostrich syndrome. Is that the right one? It was not, it was the, right not, the, not the emu, not the emu syndrome. syndrome. That's the one up the bum. Yeah, yeah, yeah the ostrich syndrome, um, where the head goes in the sand and everything can kind of fall down around it and actually we'll, we'll wait and see how that's going to pan out and, and things. But actually by keeping control of that and that's mm. uh, and, um, and keep monitoring that risk and keep monitoring the stats and the figures and the return on investment, actually that means you, as you say, mitigate that that completely and, and actually it's not as big a risk as you think it's going to be Yeah, when you step outside that. Woo-hoo. Yeah. I, th- I think that's that's the the biggest problem with fear of failure is if you have got fear of failure, you have that um, action paralysis whereby you you just don't take any action. Mm. And if you have a lack of action, you have guaranteed failure. So actually, your fear of failing is what is causing you to fail. Mm-hmm. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, you know, the only way to, I think, to tackle that is, as we said before, to 
look at your hula hoop and say, right, I'm going to do something that's just outside. I'm going to, I'm going to take a risk. Mm -hmm. And if you identify that, yeah, I am afraid of failing, then go fail. Fail at something small and inconsequential. Something that's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt you financially, but it's going to cost you a tenner or it's going to cost you 50 quid. It's not going to cause your business to collapse underneath. Analyze what the actual risks are, and then identify the opportunities. I mean, my, we're going to move on to Charlie Munger in a minute with, the, with last month's book of the month, but my business here with Warren Buffett, one of his sayings is about identifying one-foot hurdles that they can step over. He said, we, we don't look for seven-footers mm-hmm. that we can leap over we look for those one-footers that we can step over. What are the low-hanging fruit that actually you can take action on, that you can do something, you can take some small risks, and this is where we said about risk versus reward just now, small risk, high reward. And this comes from when you start doing your could-do list and you can look at the opportunities that are in front of you and say, okay, of these opportunities, which of these gives me the greatest return for the lowest risk. Nothing's without risk. You know, if you're running a business of any sort, you are running a risk that market forces will come along, competition will come along, wipe you out. You know, you could have a nice little safe, secure coffee shop with your nice loyal customers and you keep your prices low so you've got the loyalty there. And there's absolutely nothing to stop all your suppliers suddenly going, well, sorry guys, we need to put our prices up 30%. Starbucks opening next door to you, McDonald's opening opposite you nothing to stop that happening that is the risk that you cannot be in business without risk Mm -hmm. everything has a risk but embrace that accept the risks work out the actual odds of the risk and just start taking some small risks some small chances Mm And what if the uh, the paralysis is because you've had a you kind of had a go at doing something and you did throw the, a whole load of money at Facebook ads, for example, or something else, and um, you throw a load of, and it did fail spectacularly, and now that's what's stopping you from going forward now yeah. because actually I've already been there, I've done that, and I had a bit of a bit of a, yeah. a bit of a thing, but um, well, we had that, didn't we, with our with staff? Mm-hmm. You know, we uh, back in like two thousand and four, two thousand and five, we hired a lot of people very very quickly we went from three members of staff to 15 in about seven months i think didn't we Mm -hmm. didn't work out at all that massively blew up in our face nearly cost us the whole business it did um as a result from 2005 to 2013 we hired nobody Mm -hmm. absolutely precisely nobody everything we did and everything everyone we got to do work for us was third party outsourced no you know people would approach us and say I'd like to work for you no no we don't hire people that's we absolutely do not hire people uh, because of that fear of well we've been there didn't work out have it you know we we had that story that we were telling ourselves that mm-hmm. staff don't work out mm-hmm. staff don't work hard staff are lazy staff are unmotivated staff sit there watching bloody bugs life on DVD <laughs> <laughs> instead of doing their work <laughs> no names mentioned <laughs> You know, staff end up sleeping with each other and slagging each other off and having fights in the car park. And it's like, you know, th- that was our impression of mm-hmm. staff. The problem wasn't staff. The problem was our attitude to staff and our attitude to hiring good staff and actually managing them and motivating them and looking after them. Mm-hmm. So what we did in 2013 was we went back into the market. We were kind of forced to. Um, so we had a guy who had been one of our third party outsourced guys and he'd asked me several, several times, like, John, I'd, I'd love to work for you guys. And we kept saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't hire people. And then eventually he wore us down. He was like, I really, really want to work for you guys. So I said, look, okay. Um, he lived in Norwich. We lived in oh, Plymouth, still do. Um, I said, look, I'm in, I'm in Birmingham for the football uh, in August. Um, you get a train to Birmingham I'll get a train to Birmingham it's about three hours for each of us to go there we'll have a chat we'll have a beer we'll have a pizza yeah, I'm still drinking then. we'll have a beer okay, um, well. we'll go to the football uh, if you want stay overnight but it's, it's all at your own expense so you pay for your own train fare you pay for your own hotel whatever we'll just, we'll just have a chat there isn't a job here for you we're just having a chat about what we could do and he did that and within 
kind of 20 minutes of us sitting down at a Pizza Express in the bull ring, we thrashed out how we were gonna pay for his job. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I saw what would have happened if actually we'd hired good staff back in 2004 and we'd managed them well and we'd actually planned out, how are we going to pay for your salary? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and actually engaged with them and actually said, all right, what, what can you do? This is, we, this, these are the ideas we got for the business. Here's how, you know, we need to cover your wages. Let's, let's plan this together. Um, and I think if you've been burnt with anything, with AdWords, with uh, website designers, with Facebook ads, the key thing is knowing what went wrong. And don't assume that because you got you might have burned five grand on Facebook ads, don't assume that Facebook ads are the problem. Mm. The problem is your lack of knowledge about Facebook ads. There are many, many people, hundreds of thousands of people, who are successfully making money using Facebook ads. All you need is the knowledge or the right person. So what I would say is don't just blindly go along and write another five grand check to somebody else, mm. but do speak to five different Facebook ad agencies. Do ask for references. Do follow up with those references. Speak to the clients. Do make sure that each of those agencies knows that you've been burnt before and why, and ask them, why didn't that campaign work out? Mm-hmm. And compare the answers, compare, contrast. Speak to your peers. Try and find people within your circle, and the, you know, the, more your net, the bigger your network is, again, the bigger your comfort zone, the more you can actually go to your network and say, right, guys, is there anybody who can look at my Facebook ads and tell me why this hasn't worked out? Or can I, has anybody used this company? Can anyone recommend this company? And I would say, even if you haven't been burnt, that's a good way to judge any agency that you're going to use mm-hmm. is don't just blindly go in and say yeah I like them seemed like a nice bloke I would say I want references I want to see case studies I want to talk to real clients I want to talk to the clients who are no longer working with you um, and then you'll find that they're like whoa, whoa, whoa we haven't really got we can't give that detail GDPR and all that or <laughs> you'll have yeah, no worries. I'll, I'll put you in touch with a few guys. We no longer work with them because they've moved on, or you know they've they just you know they've got the budget anymore. And if you've got an ex client who is happy to talk about you and still recommends you, you know we've we've got um, a Google AdWords agency that we've used in the past. We don't use them anymore, but I still recommend people to them, and I would still happily talk to any of their prospective clients and say, yeah, this is how we work them. These are their um, uh, benefits. These are their shortfalls. You know, this is why we don't work with them anymore. This is why if we, if we had this type of business, I would be all over them like a rash. Um, make your own decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, it's really doing the research and having that, and knowing enough to know when you're being bullshitted. Mm-hmm. And knowing due when diligence. Due exactly. it, is, it is due diligence. Yeah, don't write a check without first looking at your risk versus reward. What's mm-hmm. the reward? Well, the reward is I spend five grand, it works out, we make 20 grand worth of sales, happy days. Mm-hmm. What's the worst that happens? Well, they blow five grand on completely irrelevant ads and I don't make any money. So how do I mitigate that? Well, I ask them what they're gonna do. Mm-hmm. And I ask five different agencies what they're gonna do. How are you gonna spend my five grand? And then I compare and contrast. And then maybe I go back to two or three of them and say, well, actually, you've suggested I do strategy A Two of, the, two of your fellow rivals have suggested I do strategy D. What's your thoughts on strategy D? Yeah, I like strategy D, but I think we're better off doing A because X, Y, Z. So, book of the month. Book of the month was uh, Charlie Munger, the complete investor. So, what did you make of the book this month, Jason? I thought, um, I have no idea what I thought of it, really. Okay. Did you like the front cover of it, or not really? Okay, you didn't make it that far. Didn't much. I didn't even like the front cover. No. <laughs> <laughs> so Charlie Munger once again. I always is... like these little bits that you have to say about it. To be honest, it's, it's great. Yeah, it saves yeah. me a whole. Saves lot you of reading. Saves a whole lot of reading, yeah. and I get all the best bits. Yeah, I do wonder if that's that's much the... like what everybody else does. That's that's strategy for everyone out there. It's like actually, we do this book of the month, and we do tell you what book you need to read the pro- the following month. Um, and it may just be actually a case of, well, no, I don't do that because you tell me the following month what <laughs> happened in it anyway. So, yeah, Bruce Willis was dead all along. <laughs> uh, no! Charlie Munger was, is the, um, the business partner 
and Chief Operating Officer of Berkshire Hathaway. He's the business partner of Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. uh, the two go hand in hand. He is the Jason to Warren's John, I think. Um, I had so many notes from this and when I was planning today's podcast I left this little kind of five line gap on my notes mm -hmm. to go through it and then I filled a whole page of A4 with about half of my notes from the book so apologies in advance this <laughs> but this does feed in what we were talking about just now just do little teasers we could do yeah. we could do you know, like, actually I found this really good go and read it if you want to know more okay <laughs> so then we won't be here all day. Exactly. Well, I mean, well you, could, you could be here all day because I could be going through poor Charlie, Charlie's Almanac, which is like 550 pages of Charlie Munger's Words of Wisdom. But anyway, the headlines are, here's the news. This ties in quite well, actually, with the fear of failure we were talking about just now because a lot mm -hmm. of what Charlie Munger's ethos is at Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway is about not making mistakes is about not doing stupid things and if you if you ask warren buffett what the secrets to his success is he will tell you it's compound interest and good genes live into the age of like 90 90. Mm -hmm. if you ask charlie munger he will tell you it's not doing stupid things it's not making really silly mistakes that end up betting the farm um, so they they do something called Graham Value Investing this is named after Warren Buffett's mentor Benjamin Graham who was a very successful investor in the kind of 1920s and 30s mm -hmm. and at its core it's about identifying value it's about saying okay can I buy a 20 million dollar company for a price per share that works out at $17 million. Can I buy below market value? It's, you know, if you've been in the property world, you've all heard about below market value. That's effectively what grain value investing is. It's about looking at good companies. And again, Warren Buffett would tell you he would rather buy a great company at a fair price than a fair company at a great price. Um, I didn't know this until I read the book, but apparently Charlie Munger is, um, oh, um, Warren Buffett's nickname for him is the abominable no, abominable no man. Um, because Charlie's job is just to say no to everything. Oh, right. <laughs> um, and that's what they spend most of their time doing. So between the two of them, they spend probably 80% of their day reading, researching. What they're doing is they're not plodding along just taking action with a kind of machine gun sort of mentality they are snipers and all they're doing is they're looking for opportunities mm -hmm. and then saying no to 99% of them and I think Charlie uh, yeah Charlie says in the book that he has kind of three inboxes or three trays on his desk and there's the there's the in tray there's the possible tray and there's the too hard. And he said, and the too hard one is the biggest of the lot. He said, because I just look at somebody and go, no, too hard. Oh, there's an opportunity. Uh, yeah, we could do that. Don't really understand the business though. Too hard. Uh, and he just spends most of his time looking for these opportunities where there is a margin of safety. And his margins, margins of safety are, is the business simple? Is it easy to understand? Do I know how to run this business? Could I distill how to run this business onto one sheet of A4 and give it to a random bloke on the street, mm -hmm. give him half a day's training and then he could run the company? Good. What are there cash assets in there that if all the customers disappeared overnight, there's actually enough assets there to still give me my money back? Um, yes, and it, but by finding these things that there are so many criteria that have to be hit, that's how they're finding those one foot hurdles to mm -hmm. step over. Then, you know, everything else is too hard. And I think it's that realization that there are a plethora of opportunities out there. There is so much as business owners, as investors that you could do. And we're always talking about triaging it down, finding out what should you do. Mm -hmm. 
what is that one that gives you the biggest bang for the buck, the biggest return for the lowest risk? Um, interesting to see. And again, that's, that's one of the things that Charlie talks about is the, the easiest way to avoid mistakes is to own a business that's easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Now he's talking about that from an investment point of view, but let's talk, let's look at that from a business owner point of view. It's the same thing. Totally. If I know where I'm going to get my, ne my next customer from and I know what service I'm going to provide to that customer and how to keep them happy and what they're going to pay me and when they're going to pay it to me and when they're going to come back and when they're going to pay me again, that makes it so easy to gauge. Whereas if it's a really, really complicated business and it's like, well, I don't quite understand where I'm going to find these customers from. Mm. Somehow they're going to come along and then eventually something's going to happen in their life that's going to make them suddenly want what I've got to sell but I don't know when that's going to be and I don't know how to identify what that is and then I've got to suddenly make this really complicated product that I don't know what the margins of that are quite going to be because it depends on the time of year and it depends on so many other factors whoa hang on too hard that's going in the too hard part mm -hmm. give me something nice and easy that I can understand um, I was you know, taking it back to basics so for us I want a business that I can build a list I want a business I can make friends with that list and I can then ask the list for the sale that's, that's all I want to do and if I can do that that's a nice simple easy repeatable business and all the risks that I need to take are around how do I make my list bigger how do I make friends make better friends with that list mm -hmm. and what can I do to more compellingly ask for the sale and everything I do in my entire working day is focused around those three, th those three questions. Simple, taking it back to basics. Um, Charlie Munger talks about the biggest mistakes that he's made. We're talking about fear of failure. Charlie's failed spectacularly as far as he is concerned. Um, I think Charlie's net worth is somewhere in the region of 45 billion dollars but he feels that he could have had a couple of billion extra um, so what, what would you think his biggest mistakes would be putting all his eggs into one basket okay. in an investment of some description let's sink everything into I don't know intergalactic space travel or something <laughs> Does that sound like a nice simple business to try? <laughs> Intergalactic space travel. <laughs> That's just the sort of business he's looking for. That's the biggest mistake he did was yeah. choosing that into space intergalactic space travel. Yeah. The, um, the there's there's two two mistakes they've made and they've self-identified. They say they're getting better at doing this now. And number one, the the, the biggest mistake or the no. The second biggest mistake they made is what um, Warren Buffett calls sucking his thumb, which is basically not pulling the trigger, mm -hmm. not doing anything, not taking action, spotting an opportunity and going, hmm, yeah, yeah, it's a good opportunity, but oh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe we'll look at that in two weeks' time. And they come back two weeks' time and, oh, sorry, the price has doubled now. Mm -hmm. Or actually, there's been an IPO or there's been a, t oh, the price has moved. Oh, we've missed the opportunity. It's gone. That, that time is gone. We, we should have pulled the trigger. Look at that. It's hit all of, our, all of our markers. We should have pulled the trigger and we didn't. And the second big mistake he made, um, I think the way he defined it was going to the market with a, a little dropper. He said, well, we should have just gone all in. We should have just gone heavy in. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing they do is when they, they spend most of the time evaluating opportunities, most of those opportunities they say no to. And then when they find something that ticks all the boxes and it is the perfect opportunity and they know it and they spot it because they know what they're looking for, they spent 60 years looking at opportunities. They go all, not all in, mm -hmm. but they go in heavy. Right. They don't go in and test the water a little bit. I know we said about like testing Facebook mm -hmm. ads just now with 50 quid. But what Warren and Charlie would do is they would probably spend a year researching Facebook ad opportunities. They would get to know ev absolutely everything themselves. They would actually probably spend a little bit of money to test the market. And then when they determine that that works mm -hmm. with 50 quid or 500 quid, they would suddenly go, right, let's chuck 100 grand a month at it. Mm -hmm. Or let's 
commit three million dollars to it they wouldn't because those numbers are small fry for them yeah, yeah, yeah. but let's let's talk about it in terms of small business owner we're not going to bet the farm on this but we're going to go in heavy mm-hmm. let's find something that works let's find something that ticks all the boxes when we identify the opportunity whereby the risk is small and the reward is high we go in heavy mm-hmm. because there's nothing worse than spotting that you know you, you've you're there with you are the sniper and you've been hit in your little pit for three weeks mm-hmm. looking for this one guy and all of a sudden you spot him and you go you know what? I'm just going to graze him oh there we go he's got a little trickle of blood on him I could have killed him you know it's and that's that exact analogy of you've got to go in heavy once mm-hmm. you've identified commit yeah you've got to be ruthless and you've got to be fearless to an extent mm-hmm. because they can go in heavy and still lose and I bet you they have but they don't class that as a mistake mm-hmm. because and this is something I'll come to on next month's book of the month they've got a system and that system works most of the time so if you trust the system you accept the losses. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, I'm going to bet $20 million on this. And if it works, $20 million is going to become $400 million. And if it doesn't work, $20 million is going to become zero. And that's fine. Because I know on my system, 20 becomes 400 seven times out of eight. Mm-hmm. Or seven times out of ten. And on three times out of ten, 20 becomes zero. And that's fine. You know, we, we obviously we work in the sports betting sector. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what you do when you're actually doing professional gambling is you're just analysing the odds and you accept it doesn't matter whether this horse wins or loses. What matters is the system. And if the system works, then you go in. You go not all in. You're not looking to <laughs> bet the farm here, but you do go heavy. And you go, a lot of what Charlie and Warren have done is gone against the herd. They've been contrarian. They've gone when everyone else is panicking. And, you know, I've said a couple of times I've, I've got in my personal opinion I think there's a recession coming I think we're about two years from quite a bad re- recession I think it'll be the retail sector that triggers it um, I think the housing sector won't be far behind it um, when that happens the stock market will crash mm-hmm. at which point Warren and Charlie go oh, oh, oh it's opportunity time the sales are on yeah <laughs> the general market will be going oh my god oh my pension funds like decimated uh, I've lost 150 grand mm-hmm. oh my god I'm going to cash out I'm, I'm going to cut my losses I'm going to get out of here and meanwhile Charlie and Warren are sat there going not yet not yet and they're just watching this ticket go down not yet not yet cool bye Right, let's, let's fill our boots. It's on sale. Everything's on sale. If you went to, and you know, the example I think that um, Charlie's given before is if you go to Walmart and toilet paper's on sale, you stock up. Mm-hmm. You don't go, no, I'm going to wait until it's more expensive. <laughs> I'm going to wait until the price recovers just in case it gets even cheaper. Because yeah. if it gets cheaper, you know, I don't want to lose money on this. You go, no, oh, it was $5 last week. Now it's $3.50. Come on, I'm going to stock up. I'm going to buy a load of that. That's the way you'd act with toilet paper or, you know, washing up liquid or whatever at the supermarket. Yet when it comes to stocks and when it comes to businesses, you don't do that. And obviously that's the way they do. They are completely contrarian. There's, you know, Warren Buffett's famously quoted as saying, be fearful when others are greedy. Mm -hmm. So when everyone else is making money hands over fist and when the front page of the newspaper tells you how easy it is to make money out of Bitcoin and how easy it is to be a buy-to-let landlord, Mm -hmm. that's the time to sell. Mm -hmm. And when the papers are full of doom and gloom and everyone's losing their job and everyone's losing their house and interest rates are going to hit 15% and we're all doomed, that's the time you want to be buying. Mm -hmm. And it is just as simple as that. You know, there's an opportunity there. You look at the last recession we had in 2008 and there's an entrepreneur locally here Plymouth's first billionaire now Chris Dawson Mm -hmm. so guarantee most people outside of Plymouth wouldn't have heard of Chris Dawson 10 years ago Mm -hmm. Um, many still won't but you might have heard of his um, his store The Range which as a result of the 2008 recession bought all of MFI Furniture's stock 
they took on all of Focus DIY's stores that they lost for pennies on the pound. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what the exact offer was, but I, I remember watching a TV show where he was negotiating the MFI deal. And I think it was pretty much like 14 pence on the pound. Mm -hmm. So an 86% discount. And he just went, I'll take the lot. Because he spotted an opportunity. Others were fearful and he went, right, time for me to be greedy. Time for me to go to bet big. Because what have I done? I've proven the model. Mm -hmm. I've found out that this works. I've evaluated risk versus reward. What is the risk? The risk is I, this stock doesn't sell. The reward is if it does sell, I make 20 times what I've paid for it. So if it doesn't sell, I've still got the stock and the stock is worth a damn sight more than I'm paying for it. So I'm cash rich. I'm now asset rich. Mm -hmm. I've now picked up a load of property dirt cheap as well. I bet you now, Chris Dawson, he's, he's expanded a little bit over the last couple of years, but not massively. Mm. But I bet you if there's another recession, he will be there rubbing his hands. And I wouldn't mind betting it if it is the high street that collapses as it's looking like, and it's the big retailers, it's the House of Frasers, it's the M&S, it's the Debenhams, um, that actually goes, don't be surprised to see some kind of the range appearing on the high street or some kind of, you know, is that, you know, he's, he's going to spot the opportunities to at least buy stock there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just what you can do to actually spot those opportunities. Um, last thing I'm going to take from the book, this is a huge, so many takeaways from it, was looking at what the actual psychology is behind every decision you make. Every, every decision you make, whether that's in your business life, in your investing career, in your personal life, you make for a psychological reason. So just before you're making any decision, if you, if you suddenly go, right, I'm not gonna do Facebook ads, or if you say, do you know what, I'm gonna chuck 10 grand on, at Google ads, whichever decision you make, or I'm gonna hire someone, or I'm not gonna hire someone, or I'm gonna take on this office versus that office, stop. And just ask yourself one question, why have I made that decision? Why am I doing this? What is it? Is it fear of missing out? Is it fear of failure? Is it fear of spending money? You know, so many times we've said, like, people want to do the marketing that's free. They haven't evaluated risk versus reward. They haven't said, actually, I could spend $10 here and make $250, 25 times my money. No, they've gone, what's free? I just want the free one. So... Is it a shiny new object? Is it actually, do you know, I'm making it, I've made that decision because I'm bored and I want something to do because I've actually got a nice business here. I mean, I can think of several business owners I know who've got a fantastic business. If only they just left it alone <laughs> and actually just ran the system and actually just mm. kept it, took it back to basics, kept it nice and simple. Mm. Um, we did it a few years back. I remember we had uh, our affiliate tool and we had a couple of other businesses running at the time and they were good businesses, they were making money. Yet as an overall company, we weren't making money. And the reason we weren't making money was because of shiny new objects. Mm -hmm. That was constantly going, well, let's spend 500 quid a month on this, let's commit to a grand on this. Oh, let's, let's build a new website for that. And before you know it, we were spending 10 grand a month trying new stuff. Mm -hmm. So the cash, our cash reserves were depleting. And the way we actually ended up um, sort of resolving that was I put a PlayStation in my office and force myself to play um, FIFA. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I was actually, you know, I think we made about 50 grand that year out of me playing FIFA because it just forced me to sit on my hands for a bit mm -hmm. or as Warren Buffett would say, sucked my thumb for a bit. Oh, yeah. It just, actually, you're taking too much action here. You're taking the wrong action. Mm -hmm. You're just going, oh, I'm bored, what's new? I'm bored, what's new? But actually what you need to do is just run the system, just work the system, just keep running it. You know it works. Just keep doing what works. If you spot opportunities, identify them. Don't go blindly off chasing them. Mm -hmm. Just triage them. Um, fear of missing out is another one. Envy. You know, oh, so-and-so's made 20 grand last month mm -hmm. on Bitcoin. So I need to do Bitcoin. No, you don't. You need to focus on what you're good at. You need to yeah. focus on your area of expertise. Matey's made 20 grand on Bitcoin. Well done, matey. Congratulations for you. Don't be envious of him. Don't go, oh my God, he's made 20 grand and I didn't. Someone, somebody somewhere, is always going to be making more money than you. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett, $67 billion. 
Charlie Munger, $45 billion. There's people richer than them. There's people making more money than them. Do you think they care that someone else is making more money than them? No. Stop caring what other people think. Mm-hmm. Which leads me to my photo last night. <laughs> so those who do follow me on Facebook, I did post a little picture last night. Um, I went in for a walk with the dog and I was kind of wearing some attire that I wouldn't have worn certainly in my youth when I was too worried and too fearful about what other people thought and what other people said and what other people cared about. Um, yeah, I was basically wearing some nice lime green shorts and a sleeveless top and there's these massive um, Bluetooth headphones and a lovely, lovely pair of Crocs. Uh, and yeah, I just thought, and everybody else picked up on the Crocs. They did the Crocs. Oh, were, they, that was very divisive, wasn't it? You, no, 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 very divisive because some, yeah. some people love the Crocs and some people hate the Crocs. <laughs> Didn't even mention the lime green shorts. No, I know. Yeah, but it's, it's just it was interesting. All the best. actually, as I'm now getting a little bit older, I'm now in my fifth fifth decade. Um, mm. That still makes me in my forties, by the way. Um, me too. Good. <laughs> Uh, but as, as I'm getting older, I'm giving less shits about what people think. People do. This is the thing, and that's that's the that's the sad thing about it. Really, is kids really should know. That mm. Actually, it doesn't really matter. These yeah. things don't matter. But for a lot of certainly the younger generation, I think mm. that is perhaps one of the considerations behind a lot of their decision making. Is why am I doing this? Because I want other people to see that I'm doing this, mm-hmm. or I'm, I'm worried that other people will think I should be doing this. So mm. I'm doing this because of what other people will think, and that's just it's just not the way to do it. Book of the month. Next month. So next month's book of the month is going to be uh, how to fail at almost everything and still win big. Kind of the story of my life by Scott Adams. Now this is a book about business, about life, about happiness, about success. Written by a cartoonist, and he very very self-deprecating, and he kind of says, you know, why would you ever take advice from a cartoonist? Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's there's some health stuff in here. This is the first book I've seen since my book, in terms of a business book that actually tackles health. Um, I, I don't want to give too much away, but this um, within the first few pages, I mean, I'll show Jason. There's there's a lot of highlights. Mm-hmm. You know, I've I've been very very busy with the highlighter pen. It's so many takeaways. Um, and obviously it ties in a lot with what we talked about today so today we've talked a lot about failing and about fear of failing now what Scott Adams does is actually tells you shows you why it's good to fail Mm -hmm. and he'll tell you you know there's a chapter in there where he lists 20 failures he's had Um, and every time he's failed something good's come out of it you know, I failed here, and that led to this me making this contact. I failed at Facebook ads, but I learned how Facebook ads work. Mm-hmm. I failed at, uh, or I made this really bad website here, but actually I learned how to code websites. Um, you know, I, I, I picked up skills, I picked up contacts, I found out what doesn't work. You know, often failing is good. And I think the one of the things that the main takeaway from this book is going to be Scott Adams by his own admission is a pretty mediocre um, cartoonist mm-hmm. he's not very good at drawing he's pretty average at being funny um, but when you combine his alright drawing skills with his alright um, comedy with his 20 years of working in corporate world you get Dilbert uh. which is massively successful syndicated to like 20,000 newspapers worldwide mm-hmm. and made him a multi multi millionaire and it's that combination of actually yeah I failed at lots of things I tried lots of things and he talks a lot about systems not having you know I mean I found myself arguing with him in the first chapter because he's like, goals are bullshit. And they don't, no, they're not. No, they're not. Goals are great. We've got, you know, we've, we work to our 90 day goals, but we don't just set goals. And this is his argument is you don't just set goals, you set systems. It's the systems that achieve the goals. So, um, you know. Right, we're giving away a bit too much of the book, really. We could be talking about this in the next month, couldn't we? We could. We certainly could. <laughs> but it's that key, key thing. Of, you know, every time he fails, he does learn something new. I mean, there's. 
some of the I'll just read out some of the quick failures that he's got here. So you've got Velcro Rosin Bank in, uh, bag invention. Oh, um, sorry. Rosin bag, Velcro bag. Right. Um, meditation guide. Uh, he designed a couple of computer guides that failed. Psychic practice program. Mm -hmm. um, he was a gopher at a bank, so he decided that he actually was going to set up a business gophering for people. Um, he worked for a phone company that didn't work out. He then wrote a program to do like file transfer stuff. He's had several crackpot website ideas. Um, he invested in something that is basically YouTube, but it was before YouTube and that failed. Um, he tried to invest in um, like home delivery groceries mm -hmm. before it was popular. <laughs> and he's done fashion investment. And literally there's a list of restaurants, calendar patents. Um, he tried to do healthy eating burritos. Right. He has tried so much stuff and failed. So this is a hugely successful guy telling you how he failed his way to succeed in now. And what he got from that and yeah. what he's learned so long. Absolutely. That journey. So that's brilliant. And all the systems he's got there. So I will end with this quote from Scott Adams. Over the years, I have cultivated a unique relationship with failure. I invite it, I survive it, I appreciate it, and then I mug the shit out of it. <laughs> so I implore you to do the same, guys. Cultivate that unique relationship with failure, invite failure, survive it, appreciate it, and then mug the shit out of it. I will see you next month for the August edition of The Big Earlier Podcast. Thanks for listening, guys. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. So there we are. Another episode in the can. Um, how was it for you? Please let us know. Um, how do you listen to these podcasts? Um, please leave a review on that platform. Let us know what we can do better, what you like, what you don't like, and how we can improve to make this show even better for you. We'll see you next time.